Welcome to Tales from the Fandom, a podcast that brings a special guest out of the multiverse and straight to you. And now your host, David Ginsberg. Hello and welcome everybody to the first episode, the inaugural episode of the Book Trek series uh, with myself and Jaquel Overstreet. We are diving into the Iron Druid Chronicles by Kevin Hearn. It's a favorite series of ours. This is the first official episode covering a full-length novel. We did do a preview episode with Grimoire of the Lamb, which is a short novella. Uh, as a kind of teaser to this uh, series that we're going to be doing each month. But this is the first one where we are discussing Hounded, which is the initial story about Atticus O'Sullivan. The last iron, well, the last druid, and he's a, a particularly special druid because he is dubbed the Iron Druid for reasons that we'll get into. It is a wonderful book series. If you haven't read it, definitely check it out. Uh, we're going to be doing this once a month, so if you are interested in hearing more or following along, definitely do that. Next month, October 15th, we will be covering the second book in the series called Hexed. So check those out. You can find them on Amazon, Audible, uh, local booksellers, uh, wherever you can get your books. Again, special thanks to Kevin Hearn for uh, giving us a fantastic outro at the end. And thank you to Oh No Lit Class uh, for providing a promo. Uh, if you like books, definitely take a listen to their promo that's coming up after this. And then check out their podcast. And we are going to be uh, starting the episode right after that. Hey, Megan. Yeah, RJ? Did you know that the author of The Scarlet Letter had to shovel poop for a living? No. But do you know that the author of The Handmaid's Tale helped make long-distance sex toys? Who do you think she tested this on? Of course I knew about it. Fair enough. You know all these things and more. Like the difference between Moby Dick and Mocha Dick. If you listen to our show, Oh No Lit Class, a podcast where comedy meets literature and things get nerdy, weird, and maybe even a little bit sexy. It's all on Oh No Lit Class. Dead authors, fresh takes, and the epilogues you never knew you needed. Listen now at onolitclass.com. Welcome to Tales from the Fandom presents Book Trek with uh, Jaquel Overstreet and myself, David. And you are joining us for the official kickoff with uh, the first book of the Iron Druid Chronicles by Kevin Hearn, and that is Hounded. Uh, Jaquel, welcome back. We covered uh, a little novella, Grimoire of the Lamb, for our kind of like a preview episode of Book Trek. But here we are to cover the actual first Mac Daddy big book of this series uh, with Atticus and Oberon and a vast array of characters. We are, and I am super pumped. I love this series so much. Um, I I want to just talk about it all the time, and so now I can. And people yeah. have to listen. Yes, people have to listen or they will just turn us off. No, they would never do that to us, David. I would I would hope not. Um, <laughs> if you are turning us off, please send an email to talesfromthefandom at gmail.com and explain why you are turning us off so early. Exactly. Maybe, maybe you don't want to hear about the Iron Druid Chronicles, which would be sad because it is a wonderful series. And I did a reread. Of the, in fact, I did not only did I reread this uh, this book, I paid more money to have the Kindle copy so I could reread it and take it with me instead of having to take the book around uh, because it was hidden on a bookshelf and I didn't want to deal with trying to find it. <laughs> you are a true fan, sir. Yes, I'm a true lazy fan. <laughs> so Hounded is the book with Atticus and Oberon, and we actually get into what is going on with Atticus and what is happening with him. If you did not listen to our preview episode when we covered uh, Grimoire of the Lamb, Atticus is a 2,000-plus-year-old druid, and he is pretty much the last druid of that anybody knows of, um, that he knows of, and he is in Arizona, and he has a bookshop called, uh, I believe it's what, Third Eye Books? Third Eye Books and, wait, hang on, I gotta look at my mug. Third Eye Books and Herbs. There you go. 
and he he de- he sells books and he's got a apothecary slash like tea shop where he sells different kinds of teas and he's got a trusty hound Oberon and he's he basically goes about his day uh talking to the widow McDonough yes yes, yes. and uh she she's also from the home country except you know not 2000 plus <laughs> years old uh, but uh, pretty quickly, we we find out that Atticus is not uh, not the most uh, popular guy in the the world of the Fae, because as previously mentioned in the Grimoire, but we'll we'll rehash it here. He stole a sword, and it's a very special sword. All right, so the sword is called Fragora, the Answerer. And uh, Atticus stole it um, on a battlefield, like, hundreds of years ago. And there is a particular Irish god named Angus Og, who is, ironically, the Irish god of love. Um, And he's pissed because he thinks that sword is his birthright. Yes, and uh, how long has Angus been after Atticus due to this sword stealing? very long time <laughs> i don't remember the exact amount of time does it specify no i'm pretty sure it's forever it's... since since that sword got stolen it's been forever yeah since yeah i think atticus was something like maybe 200 when he stole that sword and uh, angus has been after him ever since and as as we will get into uh atticus i guess you could say stole um happened upon took i i don't know it's it's you know it's it's cloudy who depending on whose story you believe angus certainly thinks it was stolen he definitely took something that didn't necessarily belong to him uh, and, and he didn't he didn't give it back when asked of him exactly and uh he was helped in this endeavor by another irish god the morgan yes and a lot of people seem to know uh to know who that at least, you know, in, in mythology speak, the Morgan is, the Morgan is, uh, you know, I'm, go- I'm now going to butcher it. Like, she is the one who takes uh, the dead. She's the chooser of the slain. There you go. That's a cool title. Chooser of the slain. That's, that's yeah, that's what they, they use for her title in the, in the series. So one of the first series we get, or one of the first scenes we get in this book is the Morgan, um, who's been watching out for Atticus in all the years since she's helped him uh, take possession of Fragara. Um, she is coming, she flies into a shop in her crow form and comes to warn him of incoming danger that she's, she's seen because she has uh, prophetic uh, abilities as well. Yes. And it, it's funny because it's, it's not like a normal crow, like not normal crow size, like, the Morgan as the crow, like crow form, is apparently like a big crow because the the guy who works at Atticus's shop is like, whoa, that's like one big giant crow. Yes, I think he, I think it's, I don't remember his name, but he's he's like, oh, you can go on lunch, like while I talk to the crow or deal with the crow or whatever. Is it? Is it? Perry? I think it's Perry or Percy or, I don't know. Perry, I think. We'll go with Perry. Perry. <laughs> it could be wrong. I I should know that because I actually really enjoy that character. He's he's just cute as a button little goth kid who works at Atticus's bookshop. Yes. Now after that guy leaves, um, he or she Morgan uh turns into naked Morgan. Uh, yes. Hot raven haired goddess of chooser of the dead. Yep, because she's ancient and she doesn't care about clothes. Which, which presents a, a problem when two uh two college kids walk in and promptly like are totally rude to her and uh she was gonna murder them right there in the middle of atticus's store before he manages to convince her to wait yes wait to murder them later (laughs) but yes uh the morgan's there to talk to atticus because she has seen the signs and portents that bad stuff is going to happen to him which uh he kind of uh blows off to begin with because he's like oh is was it that time like previously when you you predicted something and it totally didn't happen or that he brings up a few times. See this this was 
this was funny to me because it is a well-established fact throughout this series that Atticus is paranoid as can be. Um, like, he is super paranoid about everything. And so the fact that the Morgan is even more paranoid than him is, is amusing <laughs> to me. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, he questions like, oh, well, did you did you do it by this method or this method? And when she says that she cast, uh, cast wands, I believe. Yes. That's when he was like, oh, I should take this seriously. I'm not familiar with with uh that kind like you know i'm not familiar with uh prophetic type of things but i guess when you get down to to certain kinds maybe they're more trustworthy or i mean you're not looking at like bones and and tea leaves i guess i i don't know uh yeah i'm i'm not super familiar with the different types um i know atticus says the reason he tends to lean towards that one is because he's personally involved in like the casting of the wands and so the the magic that's being used is more centered specifically on him because i think he even brings up like oh well maybe you were thinking about angus instead of me and when you're doing it and she's like well i guess maybe that could be a possibility but regardless you're in danger get that spidey sense up so what happens after that he gets attacked I, I do believe he gets attacked by uh what are they um fairies or fae or some fairies not and not Tinkerbell style fairies which he he definitely points out that none of them are Tinkerbell kind of fairies. Yes, I believe the um description he used is um man pretty like Orlando Bloom's Legolas in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they're skinny, they're wiry, um, very pretty, um, and they are disguised as cross-country runners, and they jump Atticus on his way home from the store. Mm-hmm. And they have been sent by who? Angus. Yes. Because Angus doesn't do his own dirty work. He does uh, not. And that, that's, that's laid out a few times, is that if Angus really wanted to come after him, well, dang it, he should just do it himself, and he would, but... Uh, apparently this has been an ongoing uh, thing where every, I guess, probably, I wouldn't say every couple of years, but there, there's attempts on Atticus's life and nobody is returned to uh, Angus. Correct. Or anyone that does return, it's because they weren't in the right place. The, the person they thought might be Atticus was not actually Atticus. That is correct. But anytime they actually find Atticus, no one comes back because he leaves no survivors. And this is the the first time that we get to see Atticus uh, interact with an elemental, which is really cool. Yes, absolutely. In this case, it is um, an iron ent- uh, iron elemental um, who Atticus is very good friends with, and he pops up several times throughout the series. Uh, I don't remember if it's mentioned in the first book, but he does have a name that Atticus gave him called Fenris. Yes. And... Uh, Iron elementals love eating magic. It's like a dessert for them. So uh, he pops up, eats the fairies. And Atticus gets to go on his way. Yep, Atticus goes on his way. Um, only to be confronted with somebody else in his home. <laughs> <laughs> and before he even gets home, uh, he, he gets the warning because he and Oberon uh, get to talk uh, telepathically, which is cool. Yes. This is the first time we get to to meet Oberon in the main series. I definitely think Kevin Hearn hadn't quite found Oberon's voice just yet. He was still a little serious when we first meet him, but he he definitely develops more character as the as the novel goes on. Indeed, and I have to say, uh, you are an audiobook listener, and I've heard bits and pieces of the audiobook, but yes. the voice that I have for Oberon is totally <laughs> different than how it, it is in the not audiobook well. version. <laughs> yeah, it I um does not match up at all as far as like I'm thinking just almost complete opposite of what is presented in the audiobook. So how does he sound to you? Um more more uh I, I don't want to say dignified, but just <laughs> like uh, the the voice is not how uh, Luke Daniels does it as as the the audio the audio narrator uh, presents it. It's just not in that. 
I and I I don't want to call it a weird voice. It's just like a. It's silly. It's a silly voice, and I don't see Oberon as ser- silly most of the time. But uh, well, and it, you know, it as I as I mentioned in the previous episode, I started with the with the audiobooks. So that's that's always been Oberon's voice to me, and I couldn't imagine his voice being anything else. Um, I I absolutely love the voice that Luke Daniels does for Oberon. As we as we discover, um, Oberon is able to communicate with Atticus uh, on a great many number of subjects, but on this one, he's like, "Hey, there's somebody waiting for you in your house," which shouldn't be possible. Right. As mentioned, Atticus is super paranoid, and he has tons of wards set up around his house so that magical enemies can't just stroll into his home. And yet, someone did. And uh, with with his uh, with Oberon's perception of time, because he's a dog, <laughs> he he's not too sure like how long she's been there, or who she is exactly. But she is there and waiting and. Obviously hasn't like done anything mean to Oberon, so like we also find out that she's able to talk to Oberon too, which not many people can do. Yes, and so so we had the Morgan as uh, the number one goddess showing up, and number two is and see I'm gonna I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it it's okay. Flittish. You did it! Yay! <laughs> Yay! Got goddess number two of uh, the Irish pantheon is in Atticus's house, and is waiting for him to show up. Yes, Flittish is the goddess of the hunt. Um, she is very fond of leather. She um, goes everywhere in a chariot pulled by two stags, and she is one of the only members of the Tuatha de Danon who has true invisibility. Yes, and that that works out well for her as a uh, as a hunter or huntress or yes. what she does. And I I'm pretty sure this is the story that she wants a smoothie. She does. She was in England and she came across somebody uh a mortal who had a slain deer in the back of his truck. And so she took it upon herself to avenge said deer. So she chases this guy down, sees him coming out of a smoothie shop, murders him, (laughs) picks up his smoothie, and is like, hey, this is pretty good. So when she shows up at Atticus's house and sees his blender, she decides she's going to make herself a strawberry smoothie. But because she's an ancient goddess, she can't figure out how to use a blender. And she is arguing with it when Atticus walks in the house. This this really shows like the interaction between Atticus and Flittish, how careful he has to be with his words and yes. the way he talks to uh, the goddesses. Uh, because with the Morgan, the Morgan he seems to have maybe a better relationship with or a more casual relationship with, but with Flittish. He has to toe that line. Yeah, he has a more comfortable relationship with the Morgan. I mean, he can still piss her off pretty easily, and he does several times. But he's definitely, he doesn't watch himself as carefully around her. But um, when we see his interactions with Flittish and later with Briet, um, he's definitely a lot more careful in the way he phrases things and explains them. He's very careful not to seem condescending at any time. And yeah, he just, he, he has to be very careful. And so... Beyond making her a smoothie, she is there to once again warn Atticus that uh, he's in danger. Freaking Angus Oak, man. <laughs> and uh, and we also learn that someone else is is coming for Atticus. Yes, and that is uh, Briet's husband. Bress, yes. Bress, yes. Bress is coming along with uh, Fur... Furbolgs. Furbolgs. I see. I was trying. That is not on the pronunciation list. <laughs> so yes, he he is. He's going to. I think is like what three of them were coming along with with Bress. Yes, that's correct. So now he's got even more, and and Brett Bress is not like you know random dude. He's married to Brit and used to be the king of uh king of the Fae, but his wife Brit is now queen of the Fae. Yes, um, I believe her title is First Among the Fae. 
She's basically their leader. And the only reason nobody has killed Bress yet is because he's her husband. <laughs> nobody likes him. No, nobody likes him. That's made apparent, like through through the conversation, is that, eh, uh, you know, may, maybe like it's all kind of like a setup. But you you don't really you, you get that. Well, maybe Atticus can can take care of him and still not piss off uh, Briet by killing her husband. But this is not what happens. So, like, you know, bad things always come in threes. And the third thing is coming up because Atticus is like, oh, hey, you know, I was going to go hunting with uh, with uh, Oberon here. We should all go together. Yes. And there's a foe that Flittish has not... Uh, not gone up against because she doesn't really hang out in Arizona and it's like those big horn ram that are crazy. Yeah, it it was pretty entertaining because uh Oberon was very excited to go hunting with her and so he was the one that was sort of urging them towards this and he's telling her all about how they would go hunt these big horn uh sheep in the Papago Hills. And at first Flittish is like, dude, you can't bring down a sheep? Like she was super <laughs> Like, what is wrong with you? But then Atticus is like, no, like, these are they're, these are native to this area. They're very formidable game, especially in these hills that they're, like, really adept at climbing. And as we learn, Atticus goes hunting with Oberon in one of his animal forms. Did, have we talked about his shape-shifting abilities yet? We, we haven't talked about any of his druidic powers yet, I don't believe, besides uh, that he can heal by touching the earth or getting power from it, but... Yes, let's dive into that. <laughs> All right. So one of uh, uh, one of the abilities that Gaia has given to Atticus as a druid is he has four animal shapes that he can take. He sh- can shapeshift into an Irish wolfhound, which is probably why he wanted to get Oberon in the first place. Um, he can turn into a stag. Uh, he can turn into it was a horned owl. Was it, was it a horned owl? I don't know. <laughs> It's an owl. I just don't remember what kind of owl it is. Um, and then uh, his sea form is, I want to say a sea lion. Oh, no, it's an otter. Sorry. One of the other characters later. Anyway, um, yes. So he's an otter. So he can shapeshift into those four um, animals and back to himself again. The transformations are relatively painless and quick, um, which we learn is not the case for werewolves. Right. Um, so... Atticus shapeshifts into his hound form. He and Oberon and Flittish all go hunting together that night. And we're going to get into the third bad thing that's going to bring start bringing stuff down on Atticus. Because he transforms into his wolfhound shape. And things start to get hinky uh, for him and Oberon. Because Flittish, because she's like the goddess of the hunt... Kinda is able to influence animals, yeah. Yes, and so they're under her command, and they start chasing a uh, one of those uh, bighorn sheep or bighorn rams around, and they, I think they do take it down, right? I can't remember. Yeah, they do bring it down, and uh, Flittish is about to go claim and like skin her prize when a uh, park ranger shows up. Yes, and the park ranger is attacked by. Uh, Oberon, and almost by Atticus, but Atticus is able to kind of shake himself out of the the mental control and is like, hey, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? And by that time, Oberon uh, has taken down the police officer or the the park ranger. You know, he he negotiates like Flittish, you know, like, stop controlling my dog. And Oberon's like, oh my gosh, what what did I just do? And is really upset about it. And we find out, like, not only is uh, that park ranger obviously dead, but he was kind of there on purpose because he had been tipped off. He was, and uh, he had an earring that Atticus could see had Irish, like, magic bindings on it um, that allowed him to sneak up on them without being seen. And guess who gave him that earring? Angus Oak. Dun dun dun. So Angus Oak sent this guy there um, to cause a lot of trouble for Atticus. So Atticus's hound has now killed this park ranger. Who, you know, even if they had they tried to bury the body, but the police found it pretty quick. They found canine DNA 
and it starts unraveling pretty quickly from there. Absolutely. So, uh, Flittish goes away because... She doesn't care about some park ranger that just died. It means nothing to her. Yep. So now now it becomes uh, wherever Atticus goes with Oberon, Oberon has to be hidden with magical powers. Yes. Well, next up, we get to meet two new characters um, because Atticus's daytime lawyer, Holbjorn Halk, who goes by Hal, he is an Icelandic werewolf. Um, who works for the law firm that Atticus has hired to handle his affairs. He turns up in Atticus's shop that morning with a newspaper article about the park ranger that had been murdered. And uh, he's just like, hey, did you have anything to do with this? <laughs> and Atticus is, maybe. <laughs> so they make plans to go meet for fish and chips at a local Irish pub called Rulabula. Which is real, by the way. It is a real place. Um, I would love to go there if I ever have reason to go to Tempe, Arizona. And we meet another soon-to-be major character while we were there in the bar. And that would be uh, the barmaid, Granuel McTiernan. Yeah, you you did it. You pronounced it. Way to go. <laughs> it's not me that's ever had problems pronouncing her name. What? No um, way. <laughs> so, Granuel is... Um, a 20-something barmaid, and she and Atticus have an ongoing flirtation. Every time they're in there, um, she flirts with him, he flirts with her. But more importantly, Atticus knows there's something off about her. He can just sense it in her aura. Like there's, she's, He knows there's something magical going on with her, but he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know if she's a witch, if she's a goddess. She's She's got something going on, and he's he's sort of made it a game to try to guess what it is, but he hasn't figured it out yet. Yes. So, and that is left for further devices because after talking with Hal, he has to go back to work. And I, again, Furbolgs first, um, maybe, but there, yeah. there, there's Furbolgs, but he also has uh, the witches to deal with. Yes, <laughs> he does. Man, there's a lot going on in this book. There is see, and I was going to say that they, the the intro. Okay, so you've got druid, Irish gods and goddesses happening, uh, werewolf lawyers, and uh, dealing with uh, and, and Gran Granuel, who there's something going on with her, but we'll get to that. There's Furbolgs, which I swear I I think witches first. Yes, I think the witches are first. <laughs> Either way, I don't think it really matters, but... Either way, we, we are introduced uh, to this witch coven. The Sisters of the Three Auroras. Yes, and the the first one that shows up is Emily, who is a snot. Yes, she wears the, the guise of a, like a 19-year-old snotty college girl. And she strides into Atticus's shop. And says, hey, you know, I am part of Radomiwa's coven. I have this letter here with some of her blood in it saying, hey, do us this favor. I want you to brew a tea that's going to make me unattractive to one specific man. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Atticus knows something's up because that's something the coven could easily handle themselves, but they are trying to get him to do it, which he can. But, uh... He's like, they could do it a lot faster and easier than I could, so I'm going to charge you $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> and they do it. They So Atticus is given a letter with Radomiwa's blood, which blood is a very powerful, binding, sort of magical item. You can do a lot of things with a person's blood. So he has the coven leader's blood, and then on top of that, they give him $10,000 for, as he calls it, danger pay. Exactly, like that's that's hazard money right there when you're when you're having to do something <laughs> that they could do. And so Atticus uh, brews her this cup of tea. I believe he calls it humility because Atticus loves puns, and it's just a little bit of binding. And it, I believe he says, it makes her emit the pheromones of a skunk. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So she becomes unattractive to this man that she she wanted to. And it's it's only after they've made this deal and she's had the tea that she's like, well, now I get to tell you that the man you just rendered impotent was Angus Ogan. Dun, dun, dun. 
So now Angus Og has even more of a reason to come after Atticus. Yes, as if, as if there wasn't reason enough. We are now <laughs> now he's messing with uh, Angus's p- potential like love life with this witch of a woman. Which yes. hey, she she actually is a witch. So and yes. she she's not the nicest witch, which uh, <laughs> which causes problems because they've entered into this contract, and Atticus has to fulfill it. And Atticus is pretty much like you know what you're you know. I, I believe uh, she has to be escorted the next time that uh, she, she has does. To yeah, they they get into a fight. Emily tries to magically attack him and twice, mm-hmm. and Atticus deflects it back onto her both times. So she runs home, tattles on him, and the next time she comes into the shop, she has an escort to make sure nothing happens between the two of them, and that is Melina. Melina's I can't remember how to say her last name. Sukowski. She's um another member of the the coven and becomes a major player later in the books and someone that I really like. Yes. And Atticus is not fond of witches because witches do nasty things. Yes. They do nasty things. They're not the nicest people. So he's got to make sure that like none of his hairs are cut off or. Right. He binds all of his hair to his body so that they can't get any of it. And he makes sure to clean up any blood that's spilled so they can't get a hold of it. He's very paranoid. <laughs> Yes, and the witches do come first because after he has done round one or two with Emily, that is when he's attacked by the the fear bulgs, I believe. Fear and bulgs. yes, and he he doesn't seem to have a problem with them. I, I do believe that's not an issue. He takes care of them quite handily. Well, he takes care of them with a little help, if you will recall. From a certain vampire lawyer of his. Yes. Uh, and that is Leif Helgerson. Leif Helgerson. Helgerson. Yay. Yes. Who was a Viking turned vampire. And there you go. So if you like Viking vampires, Leif is your man. Or undead man. Yes. Uh, so they dispatch the Furbolgs, take care of those. Uh, Leif has some local ghouls on speed dial who he calls to clean up the mess for them. And they do this fight um, at his house. Yes, in like on his front lawn. <laughs> so you get to see Atticus like not only kick butt, but also use his druidic powers uh, to kind of like take them down. And someone else happens to see the whole thing. That is his neighbor. His the neighbor across the way, uh, Mister Smurgian, who uh, hates Atticus and Oberon and is constantly trying to get him in trouble. Yes. So he sees this weird monster battle go down, um, calls the police, uh, and then Leaf has to go over and uh, use his vampire abilities to basically wipe Samurjean's mind. Yep. Uh, show up, Leaf gets rid of them, fights Bress, I believe the next day in front of the Widow McDonough's house. Yes, okay. But Leaf was there because they are looking for Oberon at this point they've been the police have been pointed in the direction of Atticus and i did they have a search warrant or they had no they did not have a search warrant okay yes he had said oh go go get a search warrant um we'll talk outside whatever yeah yeah so bad things are happening like the there's there's like two different police departments that are looking into this at this point with the the ranger and Oberon and things are things are happening and it's it's not a good thing. Like Atticus had tried to keep a low profile for a long time. And things just keep stacking on top of each other now. Yes. So uh Leaf takes care of the bodies and the furbolgs and things are still not good because he knows that Bress is Bress is out there as well. Bress is on the way. And yeah, that's the next big thing that happens is Atticus is over at his friend the widow mcdonough's house and he's stationed over on 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 watch to make sure nobody sneaks up on them and Oberon's like hey some dudes on the way over so atticus comes down it is bress um bress is using a magical glamour to make it look like he's just uh, oh also he's wearing like a really ridiculous set of armor <laughs> in like I think it was in like August or September in Arizona. <laughs> so he's got to be like dying of heat and he's wearing this ridiculous armor and he comes up and he's 
trying to get Fragora from Atticus. And Atticus is like, no way, it's not going to happen. So Bress uses a glamour to make it look like he's still just standing there talking when really he's pulling out his own sword and he's going to try to sneak attack, kill Atticus like a dick. Yes. Um, <laughs> but luckily Atticus has what he calls fairy specs, which allow him to see things in the magical spe- spectrum. So he sees what Bress is doing, doesn't react to it in the last minute. They fight. He kills Bress. Now he's got a, a dead body laying in front of the widow McDonough's house. Yes, and the Widow McDonough allows Breast to be buried in her backyard. In her backyard. But why does she allow this, David? Because he says that Breast is a no good, dirty British guy. And the Widow McDonough, being from Ireland, has a certain disdain for the British. So she's like, well, screw that guy then. Let's go bury him in my backyard. Absolutely. Or he yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, uh, he gets buried in her backyard. Then, uh, I can't remember. Did did he cut off his head? He did, yes. Okay, that's what he I thought. He completely decapitated him. And now, you know, Bress is dead, and that could mean only one thing is that he's going to get a visit from Bress's wife, Briet, which is coming up too. I mean, th- this book is packed. I mean, this book, I don't think there's a chapter in this book where like nothing happens. There's always something happening between Atticus and somebody in the supernatural world. Man, there there's just a lot of stuff in this book. <laughs> <laughs> there really is. It's It makes for a really interesting read. But like I said, Kevin Hearn presents it in a way that is definitely easy to absorb it never feels overwhelming it never feels like too much you're just like okay what's gonna happen next absolutely and with this book it's setting up an entire world of stuff that happens later like there's stuff that is tied back into this book throughout the rest of the series yeah he is great at planting seeds for um for earlier things like we find out um in this book things like uh leaf has a vendetta against the norse god thor which will come into play later in the series uh and in fact it's mentioned i believe uh to flittish uh that uh the both uh the the pack uh hal and uh magnuson gunner yeah gunner and uh leaf all have a vendetta they against all thor <laughs> yeah and flittish is like yep i i totally get that that fits it's it it's pretty it's pretty common knowledge across all pantheons that Thor is a dick and everybody hates him. Yes, uh, but let us not dwell too much on that one because uh, what happens next? Bress is dead. Let's go with the Briet visit next. I don't remember if that's chronologically how it happens, but we'll just go there. We'll um, go with so it. Atticus. Is this, is this the one where? The Morgan comes over first, or is that in book two? I think the Morgan comes over first and gets out of there right before Briet comes over. Okay. So, Atticus is healing after his battle with the, the Furbolgs last night. So he sleeps out in his garden. He wakes up to the Battle Crow sitting there staring at him again. Uh, so it's the Morgan. And uh, the Morgan stays in the morning for certain adult activities. <laughs> shall we say uh very rough adult activities yes and uh she uh she seems to stay an unusually long time which atticus finds a little weird but doesn't question too much um she has atticus make her breakfast and she stays for like a second cup of coffee and then all of a sudden she's just like okay i'm out really suddenly yep uh and it turns out someone she took off because Briet was showing up and uh, so Briet's there to confront Atticus about, A, killing her husband. Uh, but it turns out she's really not that mad. Not at she's all. She's like, you know, he was pretty, but he was dumb. I don't really care that he's gone. She's like, he asked for an armor that would uh, withstand Fragoras blade. So I just made him some stupid armor and told him it would work. <laughs> <laughs> and sent him off to get killed, basically. We haven't discussed this yet, but the reason Atticus is called the Iron Druid is because he wears an amulet of iron around his neck at all times. Um, it's what allowed him to shake off Flittish's influence when they were hunting. Um, it helps protect him from uh, magical attacks. And it's 
It's pretty cool. It took him thousands of years to figure out. He's got all kinds of cool charms on there that are like shortcuts to certain magical spells. Yes, it's kind of like hotkeys. Like instead of having to do certain things, he has already prepared it and is ready to go. Yes. Um, so, and uh, this this amulet that he wears makes him pretty singular among a lot of uh, magical creatures. There was something about Angus Og in there too, because Angus Og is Briet's brother. And he's making a play, but he's doing it. Uh, he's making a play for it to be the head, like the the first among Fae. Yeah, the but first he's doing Fae. to he's doing it with assistance with I believe what demons, Hellspawn. Yes. And she's not like she's not down for that, and he she wants hit uh Angus or Atticus to be. She on wants her Atticus side. to kill Angus, basically. Right. Um. So that's that's what we need to take away from that scene. <laughs> yes. So now. There's an even bigger thing going on, and at this point, uh, we we are having issues with, let's see here, Angus wants to get the sword back and has now made multiple attempts on Atticus's life. Uh, Atticus has been drafted onto Briet's side. Uh, the Morgan has sworn, uh, I don't know if we've talked about this, the Morgan has sworn that she will not take Atticus if he is slain. Or not yes. slain, but he on the on the condition that he will teach her how to make an amulet of her own. Correct. We did totally skim over that. My bad. <laughs> it's okay. There's again lots of stuff going on. <laughs> uh, and so, like, Bress is dead. Furbolgs are dead. Uh, but then we get into uh, stuff is going on, and I guess we we. We need to jump into the next part, which is uh, Atticus gets shot. He does. So Angus Og is also affecting the Tempe police. Um, he's got a specific detective who he's put a uh, binding on. So this uh, detective and his cronies show up at Atticus's shop under the guise of looking for Oberon, who's wanted by the police for killing this park ranger. Right. So they show up to the shop... Um, where Atticus has Fragora camouflaged uh, on the counter near him. And the detective clearly sees the, the sword, even though it's camouflaged, camouflaged, and starts screaming about this sword. Because obviously, we, you know, that's what he's really there for. That's what Angus wants him to get, is the sword. Right. But all the other cops are confused because none of them can see a, a sword because none of them can see through the camouflage. Um, so the whole scene escalates and it ends with um, the detective shooting Atticus, which then severs the bindings that he had with Angus Og. And so the, the detective has no clue what he's done, yet he has shot Atticus from what everybody else can see in a completely unarmed compliant man he's just like point blank shot him in the shoulder so the spell's broken he's like i don't know what i just did but he's still kind of aggressive and so the other cops take him down they shoot him he ends up dead atticus is just has a shoulder wound so he's rushed off to the hospital yes and he's rushed off to a special doctor because uh it was Hal that was there with him because yes his lawyer was there with him they, they had already done a search of Atticus's house and didn't find anything and they showed up at the attic or uh Hal has shown up and made sure that the the warrant was executed properly at uh the shop yeah they they the Hal and the other werewolves have like a special doctor that uh does things off the book with a secure p number of people yes uh that would be Dr. Snorri Yoderson he's a member of the Tempe pack um, and yeah, he has a special team who will work on various magical creatures who would be otherwise outed by normal medical professionals. And they get Atticus all fixed up. Yes, and that was already an issue uh, before before he got loaded up into the ambulance is Atticus started healing uh, because yep. he can do that and had already started taking care of a bullet wound, which not right, the, he'd, he'd, <laughs> not the best yeah, idea. Yeah, he'd already closed over the skin from the bullet wound by the time he got in the ambulance and they're like there's no wound here and he had to be like oh rubber bullets and they're like detectives don't use rubber bullets what are you talking about <laughs> but yeah so he gets over to the hospital he snorty gets him fixed up 
they have to dodge uh, another detective who's there trying to follow up with Atticus about what happened. Right. Um, so they ditch him. He rests in a park overnight. He does rest and in a park overnight. And then he goes to make his meeting at Rula Bula, where we finally get back to Granuel. Yay! Yes. There we go. So now we're back to Granuel. <laughs> back on track. Back on track. All right. So we're back in Rula Bula. Uh, Atticus is talking to Granuel when all of a sudden she starts talking to him in an Indian accent. Yes. Or she she's like, oh, somebody somebody's here that wants to talk to you. And he's like, no, 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 no. She doesn't know at first. Oh, that's right. Yes. OK. Uh, so what we find out or so Atticus questions Granuel about what she just said. And all of a sudden, you know, she's talking normally again. She's like, what are you talking about? And she puts the pieces together and was like, oh, she finally talked to you. So it turns out uh, Granuel is just a normal mortal, but she has a witch living inside her head. Again, with the witches. That Attic- Again, Atticus the is witches. not happy about that. Yes. Uh, so we meet uh, Laksha Kulasekaran, who is a Indian witch. Um, she is known for body jumping. She has the ability to house her spirit in a ruby necklace, and then she can jump from body to body. Well, when the uh, Sisters of the Three Auroras found her ruby necklace, or rather got Atticus to find Laksha's ruby necklace, um, they kicked her out of it, and she took up space in Granuel's head, who lives downstairs from the witches. Yes, that is, that is a, a, a inter- like just happenstance. Yes. Um, so Lakshas has been living in Granuel's head for a few months. She's been explaining to Granuel all about the magical world and witches. And she's also told Granuel that there is one druid left in the world and that Granuel happens to serve him a lot of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Granuel knows that, um, Atticus is a druid and she wants to become his new apprentice. Which Atticus has not had for many, many years. Yes, it's been just him. He doesn't have the time to train an apprentice while he's been on the run from Angus O, basically. Exactly. Like, his last one got killed back during, like, the Roman Roman uh, Empire. So, yeah, he totally hasn't had one for a while. We also, we also completely <laughs> skipped over mentioning there is a magical cloak on Atticus's sword that was put on it by the um the witch coven radamiwa specifically yes, the head witch yes and atticus uh knows that they're tra- them that since the witches are now working with angus og which he's deduced he knows angus can track him because the witches can track him by that cloak so he wants the cloak gone but he needs another witch to do that so he makes a he makes a deal with laksha he says you take this cloak off the sword for me and I will take Granuel on as my apprentice. And then something <laughs> terrible happens. What what could be more terrible than what el- we have already gone through? I know. While all of this has been going on, Atticus's phone keeps ringing, but he's been ignoring it. So finally, the werewolf pack barges into the uh, um, the pub, and they're like, "We uh, where's Hal? Like, Hal never came back after your meeting with him. Atticus checks his phone. He's been getting messages from Emily saying, hey, we just kidnapped your dog and your lawyer. You have to come get them. And obviously it's a trap. It's a trap. (laughs) To get him where Angus Oak can murder him, basically. Yes. But uh, so Atticus is faced with a decision here. Does he do what he's always done? Take off, run? Um, continue hiding from Angus Og like he has been for thousands of years, or does he take a stand? Does he go save his best friend and his lawyer, and does he fight Angus Og finally, after all of these years? And he decides to stay and fight. I think at this point, he he had been teetering on, like, the do I fight or do I run, but I think he's been dragged into enough things by enough of the... uh the other Irish gods or goddesses at this point where he's like, yeah, I, I, I felt like he had to at this point. Like he, yeah. Especially with, with how uh, 
he was approached by like Briet like to be on the side. Like he's like, yeah, I've got to do it at this point now. Yep. So he's he's made his decision. He's staying. He's gonna fight. So Granuel quits her job at the pub <laughs> to <laughs> become his apprentice. Uh, Laksha takes over Granuel's body. The werewolf pack joins in, and uh, sometime in the middle of all of this, the widow McDonough sees a bunch of werewolves changing on her lawn and Atticus has to clue her into everything that's going on yes uh, because I believe he had to mow her lawn and cut some of her trees back before they went off to go do this yeah he he wanted to like warn her or say goodbye to her or something in case anything happened right um so they went over there she saw the werewolves changing he explained everything she took it all in stride because she's amazing yep um but then the, the group heads off to uh, this cabin in the middle of nowhere to go fight Angus Og. Yes, and there's obviously uh, uh, who who shows up beforehand. Flit- Flittish shows up, Flittish. doesn't she? Yes. yes, and she warns him that you know there are booby traps there because there's uh, silver, because they expected the werewolves to come and uh, rush headlong, and you know he had to kind of uh, tell them, hey, don't just you know go barreling in head first because you all will die. Yep. They uh charge in and do their their stuff and uh take the, and not all the witches are there, which is which is a good thing. Correct. Yes. It's only about half the coven is yes. there. And so we've got Angus Og, about half the coven, then we've got Atticus, Laksha, and um the werewolf pack. And the werewolf pack does does pretty reasonably well with the uh the coven because that's who they're going after yes and atticus is uh going up against uh angus but angus has opened up a portal to hell yes and released a lot of bad things a crap ton of demons (laughs) but yes a crap ton of demons come out and angus is like uh because i think he had tried to make some kind of portal or something yes Angus is like, what? Uh, I'm supposed to be able to control you guys. And uh, also sitting there is uh, the death on a pale horse. Like yes. waiting because uh, Angus has set that up because uh, Angus is like, oh, I'm going to totally have Atticus taken to hell. To the Christian hell. Yes. Which is, you know, very different than where Atticus would go. If he were to die normally, he would just be taken to, like, the Irish afterlife, which is much different. And Atticus wants him to suffer. Angus wants him to suffer. So he wants him dragged down into the Christian hell where he'll be tormented and tortured. And Correct. So we've got the, the death on a pale horse is there. I believe the Morgan is kind of hanging out waiting as well. The Morgan just is see, there, yes. Just to see what happens. But uh, the two of them, well, not... Angus doesn't really fight Atticus yet because uh, demons attack Atticus and yes. uh, really tear into him, and it is not a good thing. No, it is not. Um, and uh, the only way he ends up getting the upper hand in the end is by using a spell called Cold Fire, which Briet had given him previously. Yes. And uh, Cold Fire manages to kill the demons that are touching the earth, but it also basically drains Atticus of all of his power so much so that like he can't even stand up that and that's not a good thing no not not when you're especially when Angus is still hanging around with his sword exactly and let's just say that uh it's not that Angus doesn't have just a regular sword Angus has a special sword too he does and I've suddenly forgotten the name of it it's like moral talk or moral talk Mortal Ta, yes. Thank you. Got it. Uh, so, yes, Angus has his own fancy schmancy sword called Mortal Ta, uh, which has its own powers, and they uh, fight. They fight, uh, which they which fight. is shocking because, again, you know, Angus is like, or not Angus, uh, Atticus is totally drained at this point. Yes, but the Morgan, is this, is this when the Morgan comes in and, like, gives him her yes. power? Yes, it yes, is. So the Morgan swoops in and is like, hey... You're going to die if I don't help you out here. So here, I'm going to give you my energy and my power. Temporarily, you have to give it back. So she gives him her power. 
he's, you know, able to fight and stand up and do everything he needs to do, and he and Angus battle it out. And, and Ang- Angus is pissed that the Morgan is interfering <laughs> yes. in his in his machinations. <laughs> and uh yeah, so he's pissed. The Morgan has given her energy to Angus or to Atticus. There's, Angus and Atticus. Okay. So yeah, totally given the power to Atticus. She also basically is like, if you don't have enough power to give me back afterwards, like you're still going to die. Like that's yeah, kind of like the setup. Uh, but Atticus uh, triumphs over Angus the dick. He prevails and uh, Angus gets uh, dragged into hell. Yes, because Angus directly looks at the Morgan, I believe, and is like, wait, why aren't you coming for me? And uh, Death on a Pale Horse instead takes him into hell. Yep. So, peace out, Angus. Peace out, Angus. Now, failed to mention at this point is that some of those demons escaped out of the area. They were supposed to stay and kill Atticus, and as soon as they were free, they were like, screw you, we're out. And they just took off. They took off, which is not a good thing. No, because now there's loose demons running around Arizona. Loose demons running around Arizona. As well, Angus destroyed a lot of the actual, like, land that was there. Like, he killed it. and Yes, in, in opening up the, the portal, he just destroyed the land around this, this cabin for miles. And get something like a five-mile radius? I think so. Um, just, like, everything is dead. Um and as, you know, Atticus is a protector of the earth, and that's where he gets his magic from, he now feels like this destroyed land is his responsibility to fix. Because Angus Og is the one who destroyed it, and he showed up because of Atticus. So now Atticus really has to stick around, because he's he feels this deep responsibility to fix this dead land. On the plus side, Atticus has acquired uh, Angus's other sword. Yes. By rights of battle, Moral Ta is now his sword, too. Absolutely. So now he's got that. Uh, the coven is taken care of uh, yes, by the, coven was by a, the, the pack ta- like catches up with the, the last two um, and catches them and takes care of them. Um, and then uh, Oberon is clear, not cleared, but I think they play it off as, oh, he got another dog. Yes. Yeah, they uh, they pretend that Oberon has run away. Um, Atticus waits an adequate oh, adequate amount of time, and then says he just adopted a new dog and got new tags and everything for him, and is just pretending Oberon's a new dog now. And Granuel ha- is taken on as a uh, fledgling druid uh, because Lak Go Laksha. Ahead. Laksha has actually did what she was going said she is going to do and like totally took down uh Radamelia and broke the broke the thing on the the sword and everything else and <laughs> but uh I believe Atticus is like you know we uh Granuel is going to fly you I guess back to where India So and- so what they did is um Granuel went to a hospital and they found a comatose patient with no hope of recovery. And Laksha went in, made sure that the person was, like, okay with her taking over their, her, her bo- or their body. Mm-hmm. She helped their soul move on, and then she took over the body of this comatose patient. So Laksha has a new body. Uh, Granuel is taking her over to India, where she's going to live now. And so that's, that's where Laksha ends up. And Atticus makes her promise to never come back. Never come back. Yes, he says, don't ever step foot here again. And they also communicate with the remainder of the Aurora Coven. Yes. And, and they said, we we wanted no part of this. We had no idea what they were planning. That's why we didn't go. Um, so we have nothing against you. Basically. And we, we will sign a contract yes, with your a lawyer. peace treaty. Yes, to establish peace amongst us because by the way we're also like taking care of stuff that you have not even been dealing with yes which you know sets up things in future books which we'll be covering because there is lots of other stuff that happens 
because this has set into motion a lot of different uh, activities. Yeah, you think you think a lot went down in this book. You just wait till you see what comes in the next books. <laughs> there is so much stuff coming. And now, you know, we mentioned that Angus is taken to hell by the death on a pale horse. There are mentions of other gods and uh, characters and other pantheons that happen in this book. Like, you know, uh, I believe there's a conversation with uh, the widow McDonough after like he Angus is or Atticus is explaining that things are real. And he's like, yeah, you know, Jesus is hanging out, but he's not really like the G like he's like most represented Jesus on a cross. But so what it is, is the, uh, when they manifest in, in life, they, they use it from the minds of people around them. But because people always think of Jesus like dying on a cross, that's usually what he ends up having to manifest as. So he doesn't like coming down to earth that often. Right. But someone else comes in his place usually. Yes. Mary comes a lot. Jesus or uh, Atticus says and uh, always always calls him my child, even though he's older than her. <laughs> yes. That's always a, a fun thing. <laughs> so yes, we get we get a lot a taste of what's to come because uh, there there's you know there's the the pantheon running around that's the Fey pantheon. We get yep. a mention of the Nordic pantheon with Thor, and uh, yeah, it kind of this this book has a lot of stuff. You are introduced to werewolves and vampires and gods and goddesses and all sorts of stuff happening and there is just more yet to come with Atticus being the the last druid on the planet. Yep. Uh so Hounded as the first book leading into the Iron Druid Chronicles there are going to be nine total books. Uh the ninth yes. book as of this recording is not out yet. It comes out sometime in 2018, I believe. Yes. He yeah, Kevin Hearn is still still working on it right now, but he's cl- closing in on the ending and hopefully we should have it by next year that is correct uh in fact uh i had emailed kevin uh because he was a previous guest on this podcast so you can go back and listen to uh what he's been working on and doing uh as of last year when i recorded with him but uh kevin i had posed the question that we were bantering about and he said that it's going to be touched on in the book because he had also at the last book tour, when uh, book eight came out had answered a question because in one of the future books that we cover, uh, there is a conversation that Atticus has about inheriting the earth. If he did not go through with something. Ah, yes. And that is also supposed to be answered in this last book. So lots of things are coming up. This is, I guess I want to say that this is a book series that actually handles a lot of the stuff that is mentioned. There's, while there is a uh, things that maybe drop off, a lot of the foreshadowing actually comes to like fruition. Follows through, yeah. There, there is not a lot of like threads that are left dangling, and if they are, it seems that they're going to be answered by book nine, nice. which is exciting. Uh, so for people, I guess if. You know, people, obviously, if you have listened to this episode, we we covered Hounded a lot. Uh, Hopefully you are going to read it or have read it at this point. And if not, then sorry for spoiling it. (laughs) But hopefully, hopefully you got entertained enough that you are interested in reading it. I want I want to say, like, the Iron Druid Chronicles is a book series that is not really like anything that I can compare it to as far as like, well, if you like such and such, you'll like this book series because it's chock full of all sorts of stuff, just like between uh, pantheons of gods and history and pop culture and just it's just a mishmash of greatness. Uh, yeah, Kevin Hearn does an amazing job with um, the history, especially like he does a ton of research and includes a lot of really cool stories and other things mixed in. And it's just it's such an immersive read. Like I I, re- I literally reread this series constantly. Like I have all the audiobooks on my phone and I just I listen to them in a continuous loop as I go to sleep every single night. I listen to the entire series probably about 10 times. Um, and it, it never gets old. There's always, like, I, 
even even after that many times, I still come across new things and new thoughts every single time um, that I go through them. Like there's always there's always more to find, and that's the sign of a really great story. It is. And rereading the book, I was just amazed as to how much stuff was going on. And like we we've mentioned before, like it it's not overwhelming. There it's it's kind of just it's some of it is presented to you, but some of it's just slowly rolled out to kind of get you into the mindset, into what's happening. But he lays out a world where there is just a lot of stuff going on and you get to the realization that there is even more that's going on than what you have been introduced to. And Atticus is this character that kind of touches on everything. Like he has been involved in everything due to how long he has lived. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why this story works so well as kind of like an urban fantasy type thing where it's set in in a world that we all recognize. Because like if this were more high fantasy and this whole thing were taking place in uh, another place where the entire world had to be built around it, like to me, that would be too overwhelming. But because this is set in a very real setting and there's all this stuff going on that fits into it in different places, I feel like it works really well. It does. It does indeed, and it's it's very familiar. Like, yes, it's not something where you'd be like, oh, well, like you could totally, if you know, if if things were reversed or if you know you you believe in certain things, like you could totally see like how there's manifestations of gods and goddesses and witches and yeah. vampires and werewolves and. It's not like the werewolves or anything out of the ordinary. They're like straight up werewolves. And you you have that knowledge if you are a fan of like fantasy and science fiction and books of that nature. Like you have already built in like, okay, werewolves, werewolves are can shift and werewolves have silver aversion and stuff like that. Heightened senses, good sense of smell, that type of thing. It's all it's all there. Yes. Um, so, yeah, they they definitely set up. The world, the world is set up. This is not the. This is kind of it kicks off just everything else that happens to Atticus. If you think that things can't go from bad to worse, uh, they can. They can, and they do. <laughs> so, uh, book. What? Let's see here. We have Hounded as this book. So, yes. if you are going to follow along with us next month, we will be discussing the second book in the series, which is Hex. Hexed. Just, you know, you can go ahead and take a guess on why it's called Hexed. <laughs> I wonder. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, any final thoughts or anything left that you'd like to add in before we wrap this up? Uh, I just really love this series, guys. It's great. Um, Kevin Hearn's an, uh, an awesome writer and a great guy who we've both met and gotten to chat with. Um, he really loves his fans. He loves this world. And I'm really glad that he chose to share it with all of us. I am too. And just as a side note, while he was doing this, he was also uh, teaching at this time. He was writing in the evening hours uh, as little as like, I believe, it, I th think it was like 250 words or 500 words a night uh, when he could. And then he would just keep writing and writing and writing. And then eventually uh, he found a publisher for it. So yay. See? So all you aspiring writers out there, you can totally do this. Absolutely. And then one day we'll talk about your series on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> uh, and just as an FYI, if you are interested in purchasing uh, these books, you can find them on Amazon. I believe the Kindle edition is $8. Uh, paperback, you can find it for as cheap as like $5. So you can totally invest in this. It's not something that's going to break the bank. Uh, and I will make sure to have links so that way you guys can just easily uh, purchase it if you are so inclined. And I'll make sure to have links to the other books in the series as well. And uh, I, for those of you that prefer this that medium or um, have the money to do so, I would also recommend checking out the audiobooks. Um, we mentioned Luke Daniels as the narrator. I think he does a fantastic job. He's uh, there's a there's a lot of Irish words in here. <laughs> it's great to hear someone say them out loud, so you know how they're actually pronounced. Um, and as previously discussed, I love the voice he does for Oberon. I think it's fantastic, um, and it gives a lot of life and character to the story. 
Yes. So we are planning to have these episodes come out on the 15th of every month. So September 15th will be this one, Hounded. Uh, and then October 15th should be hexed as long as everything goes uh, according to plan. And I will make sure to have uh, the dates on that on our Facebook page. So that way you can follow along and be prepared for those who are reading along with us. And please join us in this adventure, in this book trek uh, that we are doing, uh, not only through this series, uh, we will eventually tackle other books as well, uh, but we're going to do it once a month just because it's a lot easier to handle that and give us time to reread them or re-listen to yes. them. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that happens in these books, guys. And oh, so much. So much. Um, and just... You know, the the Wikipedia pages for these things are not the best. <laughs> so whoever's handling uh, the Iron Druid wikis, get on it, guys, because I could have used your help a little bit extra. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, there is somebody that totally got mentioned that we did not mention in this, uh, in this book. Uh, Coyote is mentioned. <gasps> oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, and, you know, his, his laugh is heard on the wind, and that is never a good thing. Nope. Coyote is a Native American trickster god, uh, and Atticus hears him laughing when the park ranger's murdered and knows, oh, this is this is not good. And he yes. will show up several times throughout the series. Indeed. Uh, I mean, I, pretty much anybody who gets mentioned uh, in the series or in this book eventually does show up. So yes, you are in for a treat when it comes to some of these characters and their interactions with Atticus. Yep. So hopefully you guys can enjoy the books as much as we do. Yes. So tune in next time. And uh, thank you to Kevin Hearn for not only uh, writing these books and being a fantastic person to communicate with, which again, uh, check out his Facebook page. He's very active on it. Uh, and he does respond and comment back to people. Yes. And he's currently on book tour coming up in October. So check out the places he will be going. And uh, for him, for number one, being as a guest on the podcast previously, but also contributing uh, for these book trek episodes, uh, just with a little thing at the end of each one. So enjoy. And I hope to get feedback if you are reading these books. So thank you, Jaquel, for doing this with me. And... Stay tuned for next book, Hexed. Hey everyone, this is Kevin Hearn, author of the Iron Druid Chronicles. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Fandom, and may harmony find you. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Fandom. Subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcast app of choice. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Tales from the Fandom to see photos, links, leave feedback, and check out upcoming guests.